Hello. I'm here to talk to you about uncertainty in my field, in education. And uncertainty in education is a big concept that very few people have talked about. In fact, education in Greece and in many other parts of the world is about certainty. It's about stability, it's about fixed truths. Now, we are born and raised in a country that gave birth to one of the most important philosophical figures in history and in humanity, whose motto, whose main line that we all know and repeat is I know one thing that I know nothing. And this is the motto of uncertainty. Instead, of creating an educational system based on this motto, based on the motto of a Greek philosopher, we have created what I call a lockstep educational system. And if you do not know what a lockstep educational system is, um, it's a system where everybody does more or less the same time, the same thing at the same time, and we are expecting the same learning outcomes. So I want you to take a wild guess what you think most uh, first graders will be doing Monday morning, second period. And you can, your guess will be more or less correct. On Monday, they will all be doing the same thing. So it's a system based on fixed facts, figures, reciting, repeating, and listening, being passive. It's a system of uniformity, and that's scary. It's a system where you have to know the correct answer, and you have to be the same with everybody else. A buzzword these days, in politics as well, it's, it's a word with a high political and social load, is excellence. You know, on the news, um, it's, it, it's even a political debate. In Greece, everybody talks about excellence and what it is. And in fact, excellence at school means no mistake. But can you define excellence? What is it? Let me give you some characteristics of how excellence is defined in the Greek school system and in many other school systems as well. Excellence is about reciting facts, remembering information, and calculating fast. Now, I'm sure you're all holding something in your hands right now that um, fits in this definition of excellence. Touch your smartphones. Everybody, touch your smartphones and raise them. Everybody, raise your smartphones. Your smartphones are excellent. But do we want human beings that function as smartphones. Before we heard about artificial intelligence and what it can and it cannot do, let me tell you that one of the most complex things for artificial intelligence to do is complex language production. Language, my field, because I'm a linguist and a language educator, cannot be done successfully by computers. So in the system of excellence and stability, in this lockstep system, uh, this is the series of things the students have to do. No mistakes, do things that are measurable, uh, be like everybody else, not just like everybody else, be like the book. Give the answer that the book has in. Be certain about your answers, and of course, this is a system of control. Now, uh, educational systems have been notoriously unsuccessful at actually spotting real excellence. And there are many examples of Nobel Prize winners like Thomas Lindell, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. He was very bad at chemistry at school. And there are many others. Uh, Peter Higgs, Nobel Prize in Physics. Very bad grades at physics at school. Uh, this is my favorite example. Uh, Sir John Gurdon, when he told his teachers at high school that he wanted to become a scientist, he was ridiculed. His teachers said, this is inconceivable. It's rid ridiculous. Well, this guy then got the Nobel Prize as well for saving lives in medicine. And I can tell you other stories from my students um, where you can see this clash between the morning school system where they're 
uh, dismissed and de degraded and they're seen as not excellent and they excel uh, in the other system that I will talk to you about in a while. So this is Nicholas. Nicholas is one of the most passionate learners I've seen, totally focused, very talented and extremely successful. In the morning school system, he's considered easily distracted. And this is Aris. Aris is one of the most talented students I've met in my life in learning foreign languages. He can speak foreign languages like a native speaker. He expresses himself brilliantly in foreign languages, yet in the Greek school system, he's not seen as excellent at all. Same for Odi. Odi last year uh, gave a presentation at a youth conference. Um, it, it was something like that, in front of an audience in English at the age of 14, and he was able to tell jokes, to walk up and down the stage, um, to communicate with the audience and connect dots that we could not see existed. But at the school system, Odi and his amazing skill of public speaking goes unnoticed. Best case, nobody pays attention to him. Worst case, he's considered a failure. And this is Costandinos. Costandinos' teacher was telling me that he's an artistic genius. Costandinos can produce and analyze art, uh, and he has this new skill that is very important nowadays of visual literacy. He can interpret critically images, and he can communicate and produce messages through images. It's one of the top job skills nowadays, and it will become even more important in the future because we communicate through images. But this super important skill is not measured, taught, assessed in the Greek school system. This is Nikki. Nikki came to me when she was 12. And she came to me as a failure. She was going to a very competitive private school, and her parents told me she can barely pass her class. Please help us, just pass the class. Nikki had these characteristics, and pay, pay attention to the five characteristics, uh, characteristics she had. Empathy, communication, critical thinking, creativity, and a colorful, brilliant mind. Nikki is now a very successful professional with excellent studies, excellent academic status, because she possessed the most important skills in the job market today. Her school could not see that, because Nikki could not recite the facts. My area is applied linguistics. And in this area, we love certainties. We love rules, and we love errors. We have a passion about spotting your error. We carry in our heads a red mental pen, and we correct you while you speak. I call it errorphilia. And we teach our students to follow the rules, and language should have very strict rules to follow, right? Speak correctly, write accurately. Well, in fact, the rules we teach are sort of fake. A famous rule is that, for example, you cannot use verbs like love with an ing ending. Well, then my students would go to get a burger, and they will see that. Another like precious rule we hold very, very important is the fact that you cannot say less with a plural noun. Only to go to the UK in any supermarket and it's less used with plurals. Or you can see a quote from a speech of a very, very educated president of the United States who said, less people, well, in fact, we, language teachers, could correct him, but then, is it our word against Obama's? Another favorite rule, the split infinitive. You cannot split the infinitive, but try telling that to the million Star Trek fans in the world. To boldly go, and I'm going to ask you to deeply think how I'm just splitting my infinitives, and it's perfectly fine. And last, language does not change only in terms of grammar and the precious certainties we have there that should be broken, but it also changes in terms of vocabulary. For example, many years ago, if I saw you in the street and I would say, oh, you look awful today, in fact, 
I would mean something very positive, because awful used to mean awesome. So, although language changes so dynamically, language is a river, we ask our learners to stand at the banks of the river, and instead of go with the flow, of going with the flow, to see it and pretend that the river does not flow. And this is what we teach them. We teach them to think with certainty. And this ruins the natural tendency of every child to learn. Learning is the most natural thing in the world. It's a survival skill. But we, in fact, teach them to unlearn. And in language education, we also love tests. We're test freaks. In the language education of Greece today, there are 27 recognized exams for B2 level. B2 level in language means that you're a good user of the language. And we have 27 types of exams to prove that we can speak good English. And we also have a test that tests if you're ready to take the test. And all the, 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 the foreign language schools in, in Greece, all, the, all, all of my market functions around tests. Well, one of the teachers at my school, who happens to be my son, Angelo, said, let's hack the system. Let's change everything. And if you want to take one piece of advice from me, listen to your children. They have the best ideas. And he said, let's create a system with zero rules, zero answers, but let's find the magic of question marks. So we created deeper learning. Deeper learning is a totally different framework. We got rid of books, not literature books, of course. We love literature books. We got rid of grammar books, of course books, of test books. And we said, instead of doing the test, let's teach language. In fact, let's teach people. And in deeper learning, with the help of an inspired team of teachers at our school, we realized that there are millions paths to knowledge and that there are infinite interpretations of the truth. And this is what we're trying to teach. So we take our, our students by hand and we travel with them as fellow explorers into uncharted waters. We don't have any certainty. The tool we use in deeper learning is philosophical inquiry and a huge uncertainty. We cannot find the answers and we're not asking Googleable questions because this is something your phone can do. And we want human brains and human f minds that do not function like smartphones. So what we try to do is through formal logic, love, critical thinking, and creativity to start forming big questions. Questions like, who am I? Is there conscience? Can robots feel pain? And not the profit loss pain, but real pain. Is the body necessary for consciousness? These are questions we ask in our deeper learning classes. And these are classes where we teach language. If your brain is copied and duplicated exactly as it is, do you think that the robot which now has your brain also has your feelings? Do animals feel the same type of pain as humans? Is the trolley problem, I think Christina talked about it before, a meaningful thought experiment? And if so, how should we program self-driving cars? These are questions we ask in a language class. Why should Cinderella return home before midnight? We explore stereotypes. We explore gender identities. There are no taboo topics. We explore the, the world inside of us and outside of us. Was the prince really a foot fetishist? Could you imagine what it is to be a bird navigating through the magnetic pole? Is falling in love with a robot or a chatbot a possible expression of sexuality and gender? 
Do we have free will? Why do we even need to ask this question? Am I already a cyborg? Are you cyborgs? With your cell phones being extensions of your body. I have this clicker here. Am I a cyborg? What happened to Cinderella after she married the prince? Happily ever after? Does it exist? Who is really Little Red Riding Hood? Is the theory of evolution merely a hypothesis? And if it's not, why do we call it a theory? How can I understand you, your otherness? Why do we dream? And do we dream in words or images? So deeper learning is about making connections. Connections with uh, our fellow students, connections with the teacher, connections of the world, and connection in our brains. And in fact, these students who answer these questions who do not do one test, they do not touch one grammar book or a course book, pass all kinds of exams easily, happily, and very stress-free because they know the questions and not the answers. In fact, at this point we have to make a decision and it's a very serious one. Do we want to be know-it-all teachers? Or do we want to be fellow travelers with our students exploring these big question marks that we are born with? And in fact, our students that do deeper learning learn more than forming sentences. They learn how to form ideas. They present at conferences with great success. We um, do youth creativity days where they present their creative projects thinking in English but also thinking. And in fact, at this point, this experiment has been so successful that 17 other schools in Greece have adopted it. From Crete to Athens to Lamia, Tirinavos, Thessaloniki, Aridea. Other educators around Greece said, enough. Let's hack the system together. So now, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Everybody stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. And I will read and you will repeat. So first I read and then you. I read you. Okay. They caught all the wild children. And put them in zoos. They made them do sums and wear sensible shoes. They put them to bed at the wrong time of day and made them sit still when they wanted to play. They scrubbed them with soap and they made them eat peas. They made them behave and say pardon and please. They took all their wisdom and wildness away. That's why there are none in the forest today. This talk is dedicated to the memory of my professor of philosophy, Aris Aragiorgis, who was actually teaching at the University of Patras. This is where he started his career. He passed away last summer and he taught me and many other people I know uncertainty. Thank you.